for when the beginning of this journey was announced everywhere among the Christian people and it was proclaimed throughout the Roman Empire in accordance with God's will, men of the lowest social class and even worthless women laid claim to this miracle in every way, in every part of their bodies. One man scratched his cheeks, drew a cross with the flowing blood, and showed it to everyone. Another showed the spot in his eye, by means of which he had been blinded as a sign that a heavenly announcement had urged him to undertake the journey. Another, either by using the juices of fresh fruits or some other kind of dye, painted on some little piece of his body the shape of a cross. As they used to paint the area below the eyes with antimony, so they now painted themselves green or red, so that by means of this fraudulent and deceitful exhibition, they might claim that God had showed himself in them. A certain abbot who, when this journey was first proposed among our people, finding himself without sufficient funds for the pilgrimage, cut into his forehead the sign of the cross, like stigmata received in battle. He claimed that an angel had appeared to him in a vision and placed it there. When the restless crowd, always avid for novelty, heard this story, the man was inundated with gifts. Such a trick, however, could not be hidden from the eyes of those who looked at him carefully because a slimy liquid seemed very clearly to ooze from the forcefully inscribed lines that formed the cross itself. Finally, he set out on the crusade, was present at the siege of Antioch, displayed what he had fabricated, although others had seen through it for some time, and did not hide his intention to gain money. He behaved well there, and was very useful in instructing the Lord's army. He was so outstanding that, after the capture of Jerusalem, he was made Archbishop of Caesarea, metropolis of Palestine. When I was living in Beauvais, in the middle of the day, clouds approached each other somewhat obliquely, so that they scarcely seemed to form anything other than the shape of a crane or a stork, when suddenly many voices from everywhere in the city cried out that a cross had been sent to them in the sky. What I am about to say is ridiculous, but a poor woman set out on the journey when a goose, filled with I do not know what instructions, clearly exceeding the laws of her own dull nature, followed her. Lo, rumor, flying on Pegasian wings, filled the castles and cities with the news that even geese had been sent by God to liberate Jerusalem. Not only did they deny that this wretched woman was leading the goose, but they said that the goose led her. At Cambrai, they assert that, with people standing on all sides, the woman walked through the middle of the church to the altar and the goose followed behind in her footsteps, with no one urging it on. Soon after, we have learned, the goose died in Lorraine. She certainly would have gone more directly to Jerusalem if the day before she set out, she had made of herself a holiday meal for her mistress. At that time, before people set out on the journey, there was a great disturbance, with fierce fighting throughout the entire kingdom of the Franks. Everywhere, people spoke of rampant thievery, highway robbery, endless fires burnt everywhere. Battles broke out for no discernible reason, except uncontrollable greed. To sum up briefly, whatever met the eye of greedy men, no matter to whom it belonged, instantly became their prey. These are the words of Guibert of Nogent in his narrative God's Deeds Through the Franks. The opening part here deals with the People's Crusade, which set off just before the First Crusade, and as you can see, it was a bit of a chaotic affair. People would cut their heads in the sign of the cross, they followed a goose for some time, and there was widespread rioting and looting. In fact, when this began, the Crusaders first targeted Jews during the Rhineland massacres, slaughtering them in many towns that they entered. One of the leaders of the People's Crusade was Peter the Hermit, and as you can see in the next part, he was almost seen as a Christ-like figure by his followers. But the looting and random attacks would continue as they moved east. While the leaders who needed to spend large sums of money for their great retinues 
or preparing like careful administrators, the common people, poor in resources but copious in number, attached themselves to a certain Peter the Hermit, and they obeyed him as though he were the leader. We saw him wander through cities and towns, surrounded by so many people, given so many gifts, and acclaimed for such great piety that I don't ever remember anyone equally honored. He was very generous to the poor with the gifts he was given, making prostitutes morally acceptable for husbands and restoring peace where there had been discord before. Whatever he did or said seemed like something almost divine. Even the hairs of his mule were torn out as though they were relics. Outdoors he wore a woolen tunic which reached to his ankles and above it a hood. He wore a cloak to cover his upper body and a bit of his arms, but his feet were bare. This man, partly because of his reputation, partly because of his preaching, had assembled a very large army and decided to set out through the land of the Hungarians. The restless common people discovered that this area produced unusually abundant food and they went wild with excess in response to the gentleness of the inhabitants. They saw the grain that had been piled up for several years, as is the custom in that land, like towers in the fields. Not content with the natives' decency, in a kind of remarkable madness, these intruders began to crush them. While the Hungarians, as Christians to Christians, had generously offered everything for sale, our men willfully and wantonly ignored their hospitality and generosity arbitrarily waging war against them, assuming that they would not resist, but would remain entirely peaceful. In an accursed rage, they burned the public granaries we spoke of, raped virgins, dishonored many marriage beds by carrying off many women, and tore out or burned the beards of their hosts. None of them now thought of buying what he needed but instead each man strove for what he could get by theft and murder, boasting with amazing impudence that he would easily do the same against the Turks. On their way, they came to a castle that they could not avoid passing through. It was sighted so that the pass allowed no divergence to the right or left. With their usual insolence, they moved to besiege it, but when they had almost captured it, Suddenly, for a reason that is no concern of mine, they were overwhelmed. Some died by sword, others were drowned in the river, others without any money, in abject poverty, deeply ashamed, returned to France. And because this place was called Moisson, and when they returned, they said they had been as far as Moisson, they were greeted with great laughter everywhere. So they had moved east through Hungary, where they rampaged through every town, and this was a pretty common occurrence, so many of them returned home, never making it to the Holy Land. Those that made it to Constantinople continued to loot and destroy, and this was ultimately their downfall. You'll see in the next part that the Franks, Germans and Italians would begin to squabble between each other, even though they were in Turkish lands. They were soon besieged and had to resort to some pretty drastic measures to survive. Most of those who entered Turkish lands would then be killed, so the People's Crusade was a complete disaster from start to end. However, what's interesting here is this account shows the fanaticism of these crusaders, and this is very different to accounts of future crusaders. For instance, some later chroniclers and travel writers like Santa Brasca complained that people would only go on pilgrimage to show off that they had done it, more like tourists rather than for any spiritual reasons. But you can see during this first crusade that a sort of mania had swept across Europe. When he was unable to restrain this undisciplined crowd of common people, who were like prisoners and slaves, Peter, together with a group of Germans and the dregs of our own people, reached the city of Constantinople on the calends of August. But a large army of Italians, Ligurians, Langobards had preceded him and had decided to wait for his army and the armies of the other Frankish leaders because they did not think that they had a large enough army to go beyond the province of the Greeks and attack the Turks. By order of the Emperor, they had been granted permission to buy everything they wanted and to conduct business in the city, 
but on the advice of this prince, they were forbidden to cross the arm of St. George, which was the sea that provided border with the Turks, because he said that it was sure destruction for so few men to go up against so many. But they were not held back by the decency of the people of the province, nor were they mollified by the emperor's affability. But they behaved very insolently, wrecking palaces, burning public buildings, tearing the roofs of churches that were covered with lead, and then offering to sell the lead back to the Greeks. Disturbed by such foul arrogance, the emperor instructed them to delay their crossing of the waters of the arm no longer. Once they had made the crossing, they continued to behave as they had on the other side. Those who had taken a vow to fight against the pagans fought against men of our own face, destroying churches everywhere and stealing the possessions of Christians. Since they were not subject to the severity of a king who might correct their errors with judicial strength, nor did they reflect soberly upon divine law, which might have restrained the instability of their minds, they fell to sudden deaths, because death comes to meet the undisciplined, and the man who cannot control himself does not last long. When they finally reached Nicomedia, the Italians, Lombards, and Germans, unable to bear the pride of the Franks, separated from them. For the Franks, as their name indicates, were famous for their great energy, but in large groups, unless they are restrained by a firm hand, they are fiercer than they should be. Four days' march from Nicomedia, they came upon a castle which, since it had been abandoned by its inhabitants, lay open to the troops, who immediately rushed in. The inhabitants had fled out of fear of the invaders, gave no thought to carrying with them their goods, of which they had a considerable amount. Thus the troops found an abundance of food there, and they ate their full. When the Turks discovered that the Christians had occupied the castle, they laid siege to it with great force. In front of the entrance to the city was a well, and below it, not far from the city walls, another well where their leader, Reynald, cleverly set an ambush to keep an eye on the Turks. Soon, the Turks advanced towards the city, and many of those who lay in ambush were killed, while others were forced to return in disgrace within the battlements. The surrounding Turks attacked so relentlessly that the crusaders were prevented from drawing water. They became so thirsty that they drew blood from their horses and asses and were compelled to drink the blood. Some, by dipping their belts and rags into a cistern and squeezing the liquid into their mouths, seemed to find some relief. Others, horrible though it is to say, drank their own urine, while others dug a hole and placed themselves in the hole they had dug covering their parched breasts with the recently dug up earth, in the belief that they might relieve their burning insides with a bit of moisture. For eight days, their suffering continued. Those who had been the leaders plotted treacherously to save themselves. Reynald, who led them in prosperity, secretly and foully concluded a pact with the Turks promising to betray to them all the soldiers he commanded. And so he marched out as though about to batter them, but while pretending to lead them in this way, he and many of his own men fled to the Turks, and he remained with them from then on. Some of the prisoners were challenged about their faith and ordered to renounce Christ but they proclaimed Christ with steady heart and voice, and were decapitated. 